in a small rural village. A farmer and his wife are found dead in their home. I seen his body laying on the floor. I would have never imagined something like this. Both victims shot, both stabbed. She had some knives in her back. It was horrible. Who killed them and why so savagely? You don't know if he's in the neighborhood and will strike again. We were really frightened. To catch the murderer, investigators must stake everything on a risky undercover operation. But can they coerce the ruthless killer into coming clean? Is there any truth to that? I need to know the truth. The small town of Enderby, British Columbia, is a place where neighbors know and trust each other. It's beautiful, the people are friendly. It's a lovely community. Most of us were dairy people, so there's dozens of little dairy farms all over Deep Creek. 48-year-old Dirk Rolf Seema grew up in the picturesque community and never saw a reason to leave. My brother Dirk was a very dedicated farmer, hardworking, always loved the farming life, I guess, and uh, it's what he knew and learned from when he was a little boy. Dirk's hard work over the years had paid off. He had a successful farm and a healthy financial nest egg, but there was something still missing from his life. He was a bachelor for a very long time. Then Audrey came across his ad in the personals section of the local newspaper. They ended up being a really good couple and got married, and that was that. They agree on everything, or almost. Audrey wanted the llamas, not Dirk. Dirk did not want llamas. But when Dirk retires from dairy farming, Audrey gets her way. How do you in love? <laughs> I think Audrey really wanted the llamas because she liked to do knitting and, and spinning and stuff. She was so excited about the spinning and the weaving and so excited about life. Audrey's no-nonsense husband is a helping hand in demand. Dirk was very meticulous and because of that he's very dependable. You knew how he would do things, you knew the end result was what you expected. So it seems out of character when on November 26, 2001, Dirk fails to show up as promised to do some work for Kevin. I tried calling him on Sunday and didn't get an answer, and his answering machine didn't come on, which was unusual because that had never happened before. I thought maybe he would show up at work Monday morning, which Monday morning come and he didn't show up. Dirk's like clockwork. I mean, if he says he's going to be there, he's going to be there. When four days later, Kevin still has not heard from Dirk. I stopped in at his place, drove into his yard, made a loop of the yard. Everything looked in order. Kevin does notice the couple's car is gone. Perhaps they'd taken an impromptu road trip. It seems unlikely, though, for such a predictable pair. Dirk would let somebody know if he was gone. Audrey, too, was missed. There were meetings and things and events with the spinning, and she just wasn't there. I was starting to suspect something was wrong. Alarm sets in when over a week goes by without family members hearing anything from the couple. Usually what he would do is he would call my mom or say, you know, he's gone for a week or going away for a few days or whatever. So and he says, that's strange. This is weird. Something's wrong here. On December 2nd, the family contacts Tony Tillert and asks him to stop by Dirk's property. I kind of already, you know, you had this little pit in my stomach, and I was almost scared to go over there, but I did. The llamas had not been fed, and it looked like they hadn't been fed for a little while. And so that's when I realized there was something really not right. He scales the home's upper porch and nervously peers into the window. I looked in, and I seen 
his body laying on the floor. And it had a blanket over it. So my thought was, oh my gosh, I hope he hasn't had a heart attack. But the reality will soon prove more horrifying than anything Dirk's friend can imagine. 911. I'm not sure what I'm seeing, but it, it's really peculiar. I can just barely see through the window, and it just appears to be a body. All right, so you think, think there is a, a body on the floor. Do you know this person? Yes, I do. He's a good friend. And what is his name? This girl, Tima. Police are quickly dispatched to the scene. And when they showed up, they just kicked the door in. So I went in with them. And that's when we discovered Audrey was in the room. The couple had been shot to death. Then viciously stabbed. The bodies were on the floor. Audrey was close to a chair. She had some knives in her back. Dirk was laying a little bit to her left. He was covered with a couple blankets. The hands of both Dirk and Audrey were duct taped, as it was their feet. Uh, and there was also some zap straps uh, around their, their wrists. Homicide detectives contact Dirk's family with the horrendous news. You know, you just don't think of anything like this ever happening. So. So it was uh, very surprised, of course, very shocked. Um, I never dreamt anything like this before in my life. Word of the murders travels through the community like wildfire. How could this happen in a small area like Enderby to two innocent people? What might have motivated such a savage crime? It was so very hard to understand, even for a minute, you know, why they were murdered. It just, nothing made sense, and it was a terrible loss. The brutality of the killings is a shock, even to seasoned investigators. You want to catch this person, and you've got to do a good job from the first minute you're there to the last minute of the investigation. The small Enderby detachment asks for help investigating the case. Lisa Stewart of British Columbia's Major Crimes Unit joins the team. Having been involved in hundreds of investigations, I know that they have twists and turns and they take on a life of their own. And this case promises to be more challenging still. Was this a crime of passion? Was this related to drugs, revenge? Who would have the motive to, to want them dead? In their home in Enderby, British Columbia, a popular couple is found dead. They had been bound with duct tape before being shot and repeatedly stabbed. It was a, quite a brutal murder. I've investigated probably 13 homicides, and uh, this was one of the, the worst ones. We have to determine what's the motive in their homicides. Had the couple been in debt to the wrong crowd? Dirk was the most honest person in the world. He wouldn't own owned anybody a penny. Is it somebody that uh, broke in to steal something from them? But there are no signs of forced entry. And when police dust for fingerprints, they find none. The smell of fuel in the home is overwhelming. The killer had doused the couple's bodies in gasoline. It appears that he was trying to hide his tracks by setting the house on fire. We observed a uh, timer that was plugged into a wall, and plugged into the timer was a curling iron. This became a key part of what we call our holdback. Information not to be released to the public. The only person that would know about this was the person that had actually committed the, the murders. If you find information coming back to you that only the murderer would know, then that, you know, you're hot on the trail of the number one suspect. They hope the duct tape used to bind the victims might also provide clues, this time in the form of DNA. Also found at the scene was uh, shell casings. Dirk and Audrey had both been shot. These shell casings can be used for DNA analysis or it can also be used for firearm analysis. Investigators submit the evidence for DNA testing, knowing all too well the results are weeks away. All of a sudden, time is your enemy. 
Lisa Stewart's immediate task is to determine when the couple was killed. Speaking with friends and family, neighbors, one of the first questions that you ask them is when was the last time that you saw or heard from uh, Dirk or Audrey? We also called in uh, a forensic pathologist and she provided us an approximate timeline that the bodies had been in the house. When she tells police the couple have been dead about a week, the investigators are crestfallen. The first 24 to 48 hours are crucial in a homicide investigation. He's had seven days to either run and hide or put himself away from the area. If they plan to catch him, investigators will need to refine that timeline. We knew that his visa had been used on Saturday, uh, November 24th in Vernon area. And so I then went to the businesses where the visa transactions occurred and uh, presented the photo of Dirk. And they were able to, uh, you know, say with certainty that that's the individual who made the purchases that day. So Dirk was still alive that Saturday. What about his wife? There was a phone call to Audrey at four o'clock from one of her friends. And we believe that that was probably the last contact that she had with anybody prior to her murder. Given that the following day, others tried to contact the couple. And normally, you know, Audrey would pick up by the second or third ring. And if she didn't, the answer machine would pick up, but the phone rang and rang with nobody answering. In the hopes of pinpointing still further the time of the attack, investigators asked Dirk's brother, Barry Rolfsema, to join them at the victim's home. So I, I walked through the scene. I knew it happened right after supper. I could see what all the utensils and the dishes, the way they were situated, they were washed, but they weren't dried. They were still sitting there. All of it suggesting that the killer had interrupted the couple between 5 and 7 o'clock on the evening of Saturday, November 24th, then brutally murdered them. As I walk through into the living room, I see a big uh, area of blood, of course. It was difficult to see. Outside, Barry points out to police that the couple's car is missing. We felt that it would be an integral part of our investigation if we could find it. The brother also notices the nozzle is gone from the tractor fuel tank. And that the hose from the gas tank was down. And that's something his brother would have never done. Was this the source of gas used to try and ignite the farmhouse? My instinct was is that it was basically uh, somebody knew the place, could be family too. You hope it's not your family, that's for sure. Dirk and Barry's younger brother is already on investigators' radar. He was known to the members of Enderby Detachment. He's the black sheep, so he's done things that he should have never done in his life, associated with people that he shouldn't be associating with. This individual had a bit of a downtrodden lifestyle. He had borrowed money from his family. But they had turned off the money taps. Families are capable of doing anything when emotions are involved, even killing those that they love the most. Investigators asked the brother to come in for an interview, and though he reluctantly agrees... He was certainly raising some red flags because he wasn't being forthright, he wasn't being cooperative. We had to ascertain if he had anything financially to gain from Dirk and Audrey's homicide through the estate or, or will. Lisa Stewart is concerned by what she finds. I met with uh, Dirk and Audrey's accountant and financial planner in regards to the land, uh, the house. It would have gone to the family members of Dirk and Audrey. Including Dirk's younger brother. Police ask both siblings to provide DNA samples that will be compared to that on the duct tape found at the crime scene. Barry immediately agrees but Dirk's younger brother digs in his heels. So that, of course, puts suspicion in the police even more when somebody doesn't want to give DNA up. And obviously then, bingo, they think it's him. Anybody that's not involved would want to help the police as much as they can. Under pressure by police and family members, the brother finally cooperates. But will his DNA provide a match to that left at the scene by the killer? While they wait for DNA results, Lisa Stewart looks into another relationship that may have gone sour. 
this time between Dirk and his neighbor. He had a very large dairy operation, but he didn't have enough land to support the cattle, to feed them. So he had a lease agreement with Dirk for his property to use to feed the cows. But the man hadn't won many friends in the community. He wasn't a very popular person, and I think that a lot of people saw him as all about business and not about relationships. In fact, the neighbor may have been contacted about a very lucrative new business using the land he leased from Dirk. He had been approached by two males described to us as biker looking. They had uh, come to the property uh, to negotiate a business transaction to have a marijuana grow up on the property. Was Dirk about to set his neighbors straight? If Dirk decided not to lease him, you know, any more of his land, that that would have, you know, basically been the end of his business. Could that have been the motive for murder? Is there any truth to that? I need to know the truth. Sergeant Lisa Stewart is en route to meet with the neighbor of murder victims Dirk and Audrey Rolfsema. As an investigator, you think, OK, is there a motive here? Does he have anything to gain by their homicides? The man may have been contacted about an illegal grow up on the land he leased from Dirk. So when we hear grow up is potentially involved in the investigation, it certainly raises our suspicions. I met with him at his property, and I said, you know that I'm speaking with numerous witnesses. The neighbor is surprisingly open about his conflicts with Dirk. I think he wanted to be seen as cooperating with the investigation. She confronts him about the alleged grow up. I've learned that two possibly Hells Angels approached you to do a grow up. Is there any truth to that? I need to know the truth. And his response was, no, that's ridiculous. You know, never happened. He allowed me to look around the property. There was no signs of a grow up anywhere on the property. What's more, the man's alibi around the time of the murders turns out to be airtight. The neighbor was able to say, on these days I was here, and uh, we were able to substantiate that. The man is cleared, but not before telling investigators about a farmhand who'd once locked horns with Dirk Rolfsema. And so this individual, who we later learned to be Rene Therion, had lived on Dirk and Audrey's property for approximately a year. Dirk had a, a rental trailer, and uh, Rene had lived in this trailer. We had to move on to doing some background on Rene and his activities. Police discover a long, simmering conflict between Rene and Dirk. The dispute was very volatile. They were both very angry. Their fight had started one year earlier, when Rene headed home to Quebec to visit family. When he left, the weather was below zero, freezing. During that period of time, the oil tank had gone low. Dirk, he was concerned about the place freezing. So Dirk, as the landlord, went into the trailer and, and uh, checked on the pipes and made sure that they were fine. When Rene came back, he was so mad that he was going to phone the police. He was quite uh, taken aback that uh, Dirk had the audacity, basically, to go into his uh, trailer without his permission. So there ensued this big battle between Rene and Dirk, and Dirk wouldn't back down. Finally, in February of 2001, nine months before the murders, Dirk served Rene with eviction papers. But that didn't end things. Rene was still working at the farm that was close by, so there was still friction there. Rene's feud with Dirk hardly seems proof of murder, but in the days following the discovery of the bodies and disappearance of the couple's car, Rene had made some suspicious comments. Rene had been working on some large dairy farms, and these dairy farms, of course, have uh, large manure pits. Rene had made the comment, they're never going to find that car. Rene had said, well, if I would uh, hide a car, I would put it in the manure pit. Sergeant Stewart decides to pay Rene a visit at his current home, a motel on the highway. His grasp of the English language wasn't that great, so, you know, we're trying to communicate with one another as best as I can. And she asked Rene about his altercation with Dirk. He was adamant that he had not let the tank um, 
run dry or, or very low. So he felt that Dirk used that as an excuse to actually go into his trailer and snoop around. Here it was, you know, a year later, and he was still animated, you know, and trying to defend his position, and that Dirk was in the wrong. But Rene insists that the disagreement was never so serious that he would resort to violence, much less murder. What's more, he was at work milking the cows the day the couple was killed. And he can prove it. He pulled out a calendar, and he had it marked with all of his shifts, that he worked, you know, a day shift or an afternoon shift or an evening. I mean, he worked very long hours. So in essence, he's providing us an alibi. But is he willing to provide a sample of his DNA? He wanted to speak with a lawyer, and I said, by all means, you know, speak with a lawyer. Um, you should know what your rights are before you voluntarily provide a sample of your DNA. A few days later, Rene shows up at the police station. We went over the consent form, which clearly lays out that it's voluntary and that, you know, it's not being forced upon him. And uh, he provided a, a sample of his DNA. Meanwhile, the test results of another sample are already in this time from Dirk's younger brother. The DNA never came back to, to him, so it eliminated him as far as DNA. We also were able to do a polygraph, and uh, he passed the polygraph. He was found to be truthful in that he did not murder his brother and his wife. Is this the man who did? The surveillance footage showed a male dressed in fatigues with a bandana pulled up over his face. You don't know if he's your neighbor. You don't know if he's in the neighborhood and will strike again. Investigators are under the gun to find the vicious killer of Enderby residents Dirk and Audrey Rolf Sima. We were frightened. We were really frightened. You start locking your doors and you feel very apprehensive because you just don't know if this is somebody going around killing people for no other reason than to kill somebody. The community became more suspicious of any strangers. It could be anybody. The peaceful townspeople are in a state of panic. So they call in saying there's a fellow riding a mountain bike down the street, and he's got his uh, toque down low, and we don't recognize him. He's a local person that just happens to be riding his bike. There was a lot of gossip and rumor and innuendo going around town that we as investigators had to filter through to establish what's fact and what's fiction. Pressure from the community? Sure there was. Pressure from the community, this had to be solved. Might the couple's missing car provide police with a much needed break in the case? The person that's driving it may be responsible for the murder. Helicopters scour the area in search of the vehicle, and investigators appeal to the public for their help in finding it. The police are looking for a little black Honda. We're very interested in it. It's missing from a homicide scene. All of a sudden, we start getting phone calls from all over British Columbia saying, we've seen this little black Honda. It was seen in Vancouver. It was seen on its way to Prince George. It was seen in Kelowna. While Stewart follows up on the thousands of tips, Pitt goes after surveillance footage from the area. And we had asked the detachments, the police agencies on the road especially, to go to the businesses and to gather all the tapes they could. Including those from the nearest toll booth. I think it is something like 140 hours of videotape had to be watched to see if that little black Honda went through the toll booth. Investigators receive hundreds of sightings, but to their disappointment, none lead them to the couple's missing vehicle. Did the killer, as Rene Terrian had suggested, sink the car in a local manure pit? The pit we're talking about is massive. It just it would not just hold a little car. It could hold a semi-truck. Police have the pit drained, but to their disappointment. At the end of the day, there is no car in the bottom. It is just the investigation that's stuck in the mud. A lot of time was taken on trying to find this little car. You kind of get the feeling like, OK, this is going to be a lengthy investigation. 
On December 10th, eight days after the discovery of their bodies, family and friends gather for a tearful remembrance service for Dirk and Audrey. She was a good friend, a good person. She was kind. I miss her. The community's grief made worse by the knowledge the killer is still on the loose. You don't know if he's your neighbor. You don't know if he's in the neighborhood and will strike again. I kept in contact with the police weekly. I said to him that I would phone him once a week until the day that it's solved. I myself spoke to Barry probably several times a week just to say, you know, we haven't forgotten you guys. You know, we're still working. We're still, we're still plugging away. Investigators get access to Dirk and Audrey's banking records and discover a series of withdrawals shortly after the couple was killed. We knew that Audrey's ATM card had been used in the early morning hours shortly after midnight on the 25th of November. And it had been used at a credit union in Armstrong as well. The news brings with it the terrible realization that the torture of Dirk and Audrey was coldly calculated. He had them tied up and duct taped to make sure that he could try to get their PIN numbers for their cards. His ruthless scheme hardly worth the payoff. The first withdrawal was for $80, the second one was for $100. The surveillance footage from the credit union showed a male dressed in fatigues. You could see some type of disguise over his uh, facial features. At an ATM located in a convenience store. The video was actually concentrated on the front door. But just one minute before a withdrawal from Audrey's account. You have one person coming through the front door. He goes out of sight of the video. So we didn't actually have him doing the transaction. Could this be Dirk and Audrey's killer? It looks like maybe he shed his overcoat and his mask, and uh, he has a gray hoodie on. The poor quality of the image makes it difficult to identify the man. So we had to draw an image off of the video. Then we had to try to enhance the picture so that it was usable to show to people. Using our police computer system, we put the video out to all the local RCMP. Hopefully somebody out there may know this individual. A rookie cop gets the shock of her life when she opens her email and sees a picture of a friend. Right away, I recognize the person, René Terrien. RCMP officer Joanne Wursta may have identified the man investigators suspect withdrew money from the account of murder victim Audrey Rolf Sima. Working in a small community uh, in the Okanagan and being French Canadian, there's not many people speaking French uh, in that area. When I was introduced to him, I knew that he was working uh, on a farm uh, in Enderby. I believe he said it was a dairy farm. His full name was uh, René Terrien. Dirk Rolfsema's disgruntled former tenant. But not only does Rene have an alibi for the day of the double homicide. He was a very laid back guy, very friendly, just ordinary guy. Are police focusing in on the wrong suspect? Being a police officer, usually you're a very good judge of character. And I would have never thought in a million year that he would get in trouble in any way. Investigators will need more than this to prove it. So we have him coming into the store seconds before the bank card is used, but we didn't have any photographs of him using it. How do we know that he's not there to get a quart of milk? You're building, um, I guess you could say, a circumstantial case. These are suspicions, and they're important pieces of circumstantial evidence, but it doesn't add up to proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But it still didn't put Rene committing the actual murders. The farmhand maintains he was at work milking when the murders occurred. Can investigators prove otherwise? We had determined that most likely Dirk and Audrey were killed after they had had supper on the 24th. We knew from the autopsy results that they had just recently consumed uh, a large meal. So that really narrowed down the time frame for us. 
If Rene worked a full shift that day, how could he possibly have found time to kill the couple? Rene worked a split shift. Uh, so his first shift in the morning was from 11.30 to 4.30, and then his second shift was from 7.30 to 11.30 at night. We believe between the afternoon and the evening milkings, that's when the murder occurred. So it basically gave him a timeline of three hours to actually commit the murders. And what about the timing of the ATM withdrawal late that night? He indicated to us that uh, he worked till 12.30, but all the computer records for the milking showed that he actually milked the last cow at 11.30 that night. Anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes to clean up, he could have left that farm by midnight. Does he have time to go do the ATM transaction at 25 after? Although investigators have videos showing a man in the store that looks like Rene, they need to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt he had time to get there. I drove the back roads doing the average speed limit, and I arrived in Armstrong within 18 minutes. It was part of the puzzle against Rene, but it wasn't enough to arrest him. So why is the farmhand in such a hurry to get out of town? Rene had also given his resignation letter, which really came out of nowhere for the employer. Who quits their job when they have a good paying job and he's getting nervous. Investigators return to Rene's motel, only to discover that he's already moved out and moved on. Why? Why did he want to leave town? Back at the detachment, police receive a crucial report from the firearms lab. At the crime scene, there was a 22 casing found. Our firearms lab was able to tell us that the 22 casing was uh, shot by a very rare gun. We also received a photograph of what the firearm would look like. It was a military-style weapon. There was eight Calico registered firearms in Canada. We sent uh, police officers to all eight residences in, in Canada, uh, and there was one in the, uh, the Maritimes, and he said, I no longer have it. I sold it to a guy by the name of Rene. Rene Terrian. But did he still own the gun? Lisa Stewart follows up on a tip. Lisa went and talked to uh, the neighbor's boys who worked on the farm with Rene. When I spoke with um, the sons, you know, they had um, observed Rene with a 22 caliber rifle. One of the, the cows was sick and had to be put down. So Rene said, I've got a gun. So he went and got his gun and, uh, and put the cow down. One of the neighbor's boys distinctly remembers the firearm. I had him draw a picture of it, which he did in my notebook. Just from that drawing alone, I was like, yeah, that's the firearm. Top loading 22s are quite unique. It certainly put him as the number one suspect. But again, police will need more to make an arrest. We still needed to prove that Rene was the one that pulled the trigger. Will Rene's long-awaited DNA results seal the deal? The odds were one in 9.1 trillion. Four weeks into their investigation, police link the rare 22 caliber rifle used to kill Dirk and Audrey Rolfsema to farmhand Rene Terrian. The pieces of the puzzle started coming together. I mean, we're finding out that he has the same weapon. They already know Rene held a grudge against Dirk for entering his trailer, then evicting him from it. Now, Sergeant Ewan Pitt has discovered what may be an additional motivation for the murder. And the Credit Bureau gave us a baseline as to other debts he may have accumulated over years. He had a Dodge pickup, and there was a, a debt on that. He had a number of bank accounts in downtown Salmon Arm. You could see that during the month of December, he was starting to miss some of his payments. Had Rene Terrian, desperate for cash, resorted to cold-blooded killing? We received a report back from the lab that they had found uh, a male profile on the duct tape used to bind Audrey's legs. And they'd compared it to the DNA offered up by the farmhand. And that profile came back as a match to Rene Therrien. 
But even the DNA results are circumstantial evidence. The duct tape doesn't say that he's the killer. All that shows is that, in this case, Mr. Terrian touched the duct tape at some point. The fact is, is he had rented a trailer on their property for months, and so there was any number of innocent possibilities for how that came to be there. The other piece of circumstantial evidence that came into effect in this case was that um, their bank cards were used. And unfortunately, the person who was using the, the bank machine had a mask covering his face. So that didn't tell us who it is. As for the withdrawal at the ATM in the convenience store, He's coming into the store. We don't, he's not actually using the bank card. Those were two important bits, but they weren't enough to lay charges. And they certainly wouldn't have been enough to prosecute. And we felt that we should further investigation to make sure that if we were gonna lay a charge, that we wanted to be 100% positive that we would get a conviction at the end of the day. Months pass, but investigators seem no closer to proving the former farmhand is Dirk and Audrey Rolf Sima's killer. Mr. Terrian had moved back to Quebec by this point, and all of their other leads had gone cold. That the killer is still at large gnaws away at the police and the community. Some of the neighbors, they would maybe criticize the, the investigators or the police because it wasn't happening fast enough. You know, this should be dealt with you know, in short order. Well, when you try to explain to them that, uh, you know, these types of investigations do take time and you've got to understand that. Finally, in December of 2002, a year after the murders, another officer and myself went down to Quebec and launch a crack undercover operation they hope will see Rene admit to the murders. As time goes on, if they haven't been caught, they feel a little bit more at ease. And so that's to our advantage. Agents posing as criminals carefully court him. They are trying to get Rene to be part of their group. And in order to get the job in the organization, you have to be absolutely clean with uh, no baggage. They are trying to get Rene to speak freely about uh, things that he's done in the past. If you've got any problem that the police are going to be looking into is tell us because we could make it go away. But you have to tell us the details. Like it's a chess game, you know, and, and we're being very strategic. In this case, it took, I believe it was about seven months to get Rene to have the confidence in the undercover operators to be friends, to be their pals. That's when investigators make their move asking Rene to attend a crucial meeting with Mr. Big, the supposed head of the illicit operation. Bob Gobel watches from a nearby room. First, Rene admits to killing the couple. Then... I came back and I cut her down. And I put some gas up there, down the sofa, and I went to Armstrong. There were a number of holdback uh, bits of evidence, and Mr. Terrian was able to give it all and correctly. He probably brought out four or five points only he would have known. And of course, the biggest one was uh, the timer and the curling iron. I went back after I put the timer. I found the iron there, and I said, oh, it might be worth it. And I have to cover what I did. He said that he had set the timer when he was leaving, the timer would go off, the house would start on fire, and all the evidence would be destroyed. I should try the timer first, you know? Probably one of the biggest shocks he ever got was when he came back and that house was still standing. Investigators finally have Rene Terrian where they want him. When you're sitting in a couple rooms over, watching on a monitor, him confessing, or telling you your whole back that, that only three or four of you have, have known for three years, I mean, that's something that you'll never forget. But police are still missing one crucial piece of evidence. The helicopter couldn't find it. Our search and rescue people couldn't find where was the car. A painstaking undercover operation has seen suspect Rene Terrian revealing information only the killer of this couple would know. I came back and I cut her down. And I put some gas up there. But is Terrian's confession enough to convict him of the crime? We don't want to run the risk of having a defense lawyer uh, attack our investigation and have things thrown out. 
the team decides to go after one final piece of the puzzle. One of the things that Rene revealed in his interview with Mr. Big was that he had hidden the car and that he had hidden it that, that nobody would ever find it. Mr. Big convinces Rene he must destroy all evidence of the murders. Rene falls for their ruse and leads them back to BC. And one of the first things that we had him do was point out to our undercover operators to where the car was. And, you know, it was within a highly wooded area. It's up a little forestry road with a huge, deep ravine with lots of uh, cedar trees. And Rene said after he had committed the murders, he had gotten in the car, driven it up this road, and uh, just basically pushed it off the cliff. And that's where it was. And in fact, a tree had fallen on it. So that's why when the search and rescue had gone out in an effort to locate the vehicle, they couldn't see it from the air because it was concealed by, uh, by the tree. It is the final piece of indisputable evidence the investigators need. The following day, the undercover operator told Rene to meet him at a gas station in West Kelowna. Myself and another police officer, we walked in and I arrested him for uh, the first degree murder of both Audrey and Dirk. After three years of intense investigation, Dirk and Audrey Rolfsema's killer has finally been caught. It was satisfying. Yeah, it was satisfying. It was a big relief when there was an arrest. Now in police custody, Rene confesses to investigators, casually relating how he ruthlessly murdered the couple. He's kind of scared, but she wasn't, you know, he's the big guy, but she kind of got the balls for that then I punch her. And it's like, you know, then got no turning back, you know, so that then I shoot. Was it just unfortunate that Audrey was there? Yeah. Because you didn't mind her. No, right? I'm she was sure. okay. Yeah. But you, you found yourself in a position where once you decided to go beyond that point of no return, mm -hmm. you couldn't stop that just him, right? No. And on November 5th, 2006, nearly five years after their deaths, Rene Terrian pleads guilty to the second degree murders of Dirk and Audrey Rolfsema. He is sentenced to 18 years in prison with no chance of parole. To this day, myself and the other investigators, we never really knew what the motive was. Was it financial? Well, financial, what did he get? A couple hundred bucks, you know? Was it anger or was it hatred? Only Rene knows, and he's never told us. With the killer safely behind bars, Family and friends commemorate the couple at their favorite spot in Enderby. It's just a little memorial of a picture of Dirk and Audrey. And, uh... Time heals, but you don't forget. He robbed them of an amazing life together. There's nothing anybody can do to give that back. People always say, well, it brings closure to the family. It never does. It just doesn't. In 2007, the investigators received a special commendation from the Crown Prosecutor for their hard work and exceptional diligence. It's important to say well done and thank you when it's deserving, and uh, they certainly deserved it in this case. We have a job to do. People rely on us, and the satisfaction from meeting with the families afterwards and having them thank us. That's all it's all about. On the banks of the Wisconsin River, the discovery of a woman's dismembered body. Whatever happened to her was very horrible. Our goal was to find all of the body parts. But without a face and without an identity, she seemed to be lost. Who is she, and what kind of madness possessed her attacker? I cast her aside like trash in a garbage bag. She was truly an innocent person at the hands of a monster. Can investigators piece together the blood-chilling tale 
and catch a remorseless killer. Spring Green, a picturesque village on the shores of the Wisconsin River, where locals and tourists gather to play. There's a lot of canoeing, kayaking, rafting, and swimming in that area. July 30th, 1999, a sunny Friday afternoon. Two kids on vacation with their mom are exploring the riverbank when they come across a bag containing what appears to be body parts. The concerned mother contacts police. 911. Detective Joseph Welsh and prosecutor Patricia Barrett are called to the scene of the gruesome discovery. There was a trail that led off of a parking lot. It's kind of wooded. When you got about halfway down that little pathway, you could actually smell something rotten. It was in a black garbage bag. Inside are human remains. This, in fact, appeared to be only the torso. And we were able to examine the torso and see that it was what appeared to be a female black individual. Who is this unidentified woman? And how had her life come to such a horrific end? To find something like this was just unheard of. The discovery was very disturbing. But the fact that we didn't have all of the victim was even more disturbing. Detective Elizabeth Fiegels joins the team for a search of the area. We were looking for any sort of black garbage bags or anything that could contain body parts. It doesn't take long for investigators to spot something out of place. We could see there was a black canvas bag that was hanging on the tree limb over the Wisconsin River. The duffel bag was seized because it was certainly big enough to contain the torso. Police questioned shocked bystanders who provide investigators with their first lead. We were initially told by the person that found the torso that there was a strange gentleman hanging in the area. Had he committed the brutal murder and was then drawn back to the scene? Three different people who were interviewed had information about this white male. And details of his suspicious behavior. He had said something about, well, it, it smells really bad, or the police better have gas masks. And uh, shortly after, he disappeared. Leaving the parking lot in a white truck. No one had a license plate. And the actual descriptions of what this particular white male looked like varied. We didn't know if he was a suspect. He could have been a witness to the crime. What they do know is that if they hope to find him, they'll need to move fast. Information regarding his physical description and his vehicle was broadcast to law enforcement agencies. Investigators, meanwhile, secured the crime scene for the night. There was a forecasted thunderstorm coming in. Early the following morning, the sheriff's office launches a comprehensive search of the river to find the rest of the victim. We didn't know if the person had possibly kept some body parts as trophies. Our goal was to find all of the body parts and just put everything together. We returned with several officers, the Department of Natural Resources, anyone in the area that had boats. There were several fishing boats being put into the water, probably five or six boats in there. And then there was an attempt to notify people who were actually on the water to go ahead and be on the lookout. Finally, it is a tourist who spots something. Floating in the water, another black garbage bag, and then another. We recovered four or five bags that comprised her whole being. Some of the body parts had been wrapped in multiple bags grocery store chain bags inside of garbage bags. When investigators examined the victim's head, they discovered the killer had not only taken her life, he had obliterated her identity. 
It was very clear that this victim would not be recognizable by uh, friends or relatives. Without a face and without an identity, she seemed to be lost. The gruesome discovery sends shockwaves through the community. I think a lot of people became very afraid of the fact that there was some kind of maniac serial killer. Police try to quell the fear, but they are up against vivid public memories. Wisconsin is very familiar with serial killer cases in that it's Ed, Ed Gein, who became famous in the 50s, uh, killing several women. You've got Jeffrey Dahmer, of course. Both murderers notorious for having dismembered their many victims. Was this woman killed at the hands of another, following in their bloody footsteps? I didn't know what we were dealing with. Someone was just trying to hide the corpse, or this was a possibility that there was a, a serial killer. Can police find the brutal murderer before he strikes again? There's nowhere to look until you know who your victim is. On the banks of the Wisconsin River, the body of a young black woman has been found dismembered and rendered unrecognizable. From looking at the face, there was absolutely no way we were able to identify who that was. It was a horrific crime. Is a serial killer on the rampage? Police pour through their databases in search of any similar cases. There weren't any in the state of Wisconsin. Then they spread out nationwide. 10 days earlier, there was a similar case in New Hampshire in which the woman's body had also been skillfully dismembered. This victim had been disarticulated, meaning surgically taken apart. Could that precision be the key to the killer's identity? It was somebody who had done something like that, at least with animals before. A hunter, perhaps, or even a butcher. That's often the way animals are done for processing. Was this the killer's grisly signature? left behind in both New Hampshire and Wisconsin. They might be dealing with somebody who was traveling through various areas, doing the same types of crimes. While investigators compare notes with the New Hampshire authorities, Wisconsin police continue the search for the strange man leaving their crime scene in a white vehicle. We put out an attempt to locate for that truck and that subject. But with each passing hour, investigators lose hope of finding him. We had no license plate or anything to go on. That's when police get wind of another lead. A man came forward and said that he was on the Wisconsin River. He had discovered the duffel bag in the water, and he dragged it to the shoreline. He says he thought it was camping equipment. He dumped the bag onto the ground. He realized because of the smell that it obviously wasn't camping equipment. He assumed it was an animal, and he left the torso on the riverbank. Then, in his attempt to salvage the duffel bag, he took that bag and just hung it up over the tree uh, where we had located it. Police bring the young man in for questioning, and though they quickly determined he had no connection to the murder, we had now made a connection from that simple duffel bag to the torso that we had found. For investigators, however, that's barely the beginning. It's very difficult to pursue an investigation in a meaningful way if you don't know who your victim is. They hope the autopsy will provide some clues. We were able to determine that she was from 16 to 25 years old. Five foot two to five foot four tall, approximately 150 pounds. Had no distinguishing tattoos, no scars. There were no fillings, there were perfect teeth. So the odds of finding dental records that would be useful to our investigation was pretty remote. She was someone's daughter, perhaps someone's sister, now known only as Jane Doe. But the detectives have a plan for identifying her. We had found the hands. We can identify her with fingerprints. Or so they hope. They run the victim's prints through the National Crime Information Center's database. But if an individual has never been arrested, or for whatever reason, they never had their fingerprints on file, you would not get any response. And though a fingerprint could be all it takes to get the investigation into high gear. Came up with nothing. 
No one had these prints on file. Undaunted, the detectives turned to the nationwide database of missing people. The missing black females that we had throughout the United States were in the area of over a 1,000. That was overwhelming. We had our work cut out for us. Going through the list, we got it down to about six or 700. Missing women that might be their Jane Doe. Detective Welch and I established a phone bank with 10 telephones. We divided the agencies up into states. And investigated each and every name on the list. If we miss simply one person, that could be our person that was the victim. So we wanted to make sure that we covered all bases. But despite the team's massive effort, at the end of the week-long telephone calls, we came up with nothing. Desperate for any break in the case, investigators appealed to the general public for help in identifying their victim. A cab driver had picked up a, a woman who was a dancer at one of the local clubs. The cab driver thought that she matched the description of our Jane Doe. But when police follow up on the story, we were able to determine her fingerprints and tattoos, eliminated her as our possible Jane Doe. In the days following, law enforcement really had created a lot of follow-up work to try to run down each of these tips. A mother called and reported that she was concerned our Jane Doe may have been her daughter. But the lead goes nowhere. That's when investigators receive a tip they hope will help unravel the mystery of the murdered woman. The caller tells police that the victim is from San Francisco and that her name is Dolores. We then obtained a search warrant for telephone records from the tip line. We then went and interviewed the subscriber to that telephone. It soon became apparent that this individual was not stable, that he was delusional. He had no one that was close to anyone that we felt was our victim. It seemed like a lot of work spinning our wheels. Just as it seems the investigation will never get traction. Manchester, New Hampshire had a suspect in their case. Is he also the ruthless killer of Wisconsin's Jane Doe? And does he have others in his sights? We were fearful of another discovery of a dismembered corpse. Weeks after the shocking discovery of a dismembered female body in Wisconsin, there is a possible breakthrough in the investigation. A 39-year-old Czech native, Václav Pilch, has been arrested and charged with murder and dismemberment in New Hampshire. It was known that he worked in a meatpacking plant and was a meat cutter. Could he also be the mystery woman's killer? After he left New Hampshire, he went to the state of Maine and then went to Texas. Had Pilch traveled through Wisconsin on a killing spree? The investigators who were working that case at the time did an extensive interview of that suspect. To the disappointment of police on the Jane Doe case, they completely accounted for his time on a timeline, and they were not able to link him with Wisconsin in any way. With few other leads, the investigation comes to a standstill. Months do pass by, and it's very, very frustrating. Everything that we were working on, every lead that we had, we were coming to a dead end. And their greatest challenge might lie not with identifying the killer, but rather his prey. No additional information could be gleaned about the identity of the victim. It was absolutely critical that we identify the victim as soon as possible so that we can do a really constructive investigation. The next step was that uh, facial reconstruction needed to be done. Investigators looked to world-renowned forensic anthropologist Leslie Eisenberg for help. I was approached by Detective Joe Welch, who was interested in having a facial approximation done. In other words, an attempt for someone to build a face on the skull. It's a tall order to take the woman's skull, some ethnographic data and a lot of imagination, and craft a face that might look like the victim. You 
never know what the unknown person actually looked like. But the goal of doing something like this is to spark something in someone looking at the photo of the facial approximation. There's a problem, however, and it's a big one. It would have required utilizing the head that actually was recovered. And Jane Doe's head still has traces of tissue attached, a serious stumbling block for a reconstructive process that requires a dry, clean skull. In removing the soft tissue, you would also be removing evidence. There were knife marks or tool marks that were discovered, which could have some potential evidentiary value. Barrett must make a difficult choice. Remove the flesh to help identify the victim or preserve the evidence to help prosecute her killer. District Attorney Barrett said that she did not want it done. She said no. I was unwilling this early in the case to have the actual head itself be damaged in any way. I was concerned when District Attorney Barrett said no. Detective Welsh was very unhappy with my answer. He actually leaned across my desk to tell me that he didn't think that I was making the right decision in this matter. My concern was where do we go from here and how do we get this information out to the public without having a clay reconstruction done? And I told him that it was my decision in this matter and that there had to be another way. If he wanted it that badly, he was going to find the other way. The detectives are stumped. I went to Dr. Eisenberg again and asked her if there was any alternative. She has a radical idea, one that involves an engineering process known as rapid prototyping. What that involves is creating a mock-up or a replica of anything you can imagine. It could be a machine part. It could be part of a skull used in preparation by a plastic surgeon to practice a surgery. Could they use the process to build an exact replica of the victim's skull? If so... A facial approximation could be done without damaging the original skull. Providing investigators with a face that might lead them to Jane Doe's identity. The process would be groundbreaking. This was an opportunity to bring engineering and rapid prototyping and apply it to a real world forensic situation. I was stunned. It was science I had never heard of. But will it work? Investigators send the skull to the local hospital for a CT scan that reveals the contours of the bone. We took that CAT scan to the Milwaukee School of Engineering. Those data are fed into a machine. Designed to build industrial prototypes from thin layers of paper. There are about 4,000 sheets of paper per inch. The laser cuts each sheet to form a thin cross-section of the skull. The CAT scan data tell the machine where to cut the contours. The cut sheet then provides a foundation for the next layer. The skull is being built from the bottom up. After 30 hours of production, the result appears to be nothing more than a big block of paper. But it's what lies within it that counts. You need to chip away at the extra raw material that was laid down by the sheets of paper. The final product stuns investigators. When I first saw the skull, I was amazed. It was, it was nothing like I was expecting. I would have thought it could be an actual skull. Dr. Eisenberg was able to examine the synthetic skull, now obviously with no tissue on it, and could do precise measurements. That's when the doctor makes a surprising discovery. The shape of the skull, the distance between the eye sockets, the distance between the front of the skull to the back of the skull suggested to me that perhaps she wasn't necessarily an American black, but perhaps an African black. It's an important distinction and one that will have a significant impact on the way the forensic artist goes about her work. It's not simply taking clay and laying it on the skull. Because certain ethnic regions have thicker skin in certain areas, 
on their cheeks, on their jawbone, on the back of their head, for example. Recreating those genetic characteristics requires an ingenious sleight of hand. What you need to do is first, at predetermined anatomical landmarks, place what are called tissue depth markers. Cut to different depths for different portions of the face based on your ethnicity. With the markers in place, the forensic artist carefully lays clay to cover them. That's when the delicate work begins. Molding a nose and sculpting cheekbones. Creating lips, creating eyelids, creating eyebrows. Putting in the finishing touches that make a face a face. Finally, the face emerges. I was very hopeful that somehow this would be close. But is it that of Jane Doe? There's always still the question in the back of your mind, thinking, is this really what she looks like? Two months after an unknown woman is found dismembered in the Wisconsin River, an innovative use of technology puts a face to investigators Jane Doe. There was something kind of warming about seeing our victim's face. And we just knew we had so much more work to do for her. But how good a likeness is this clay model? I was very hopeful that somehow this would be close. To increase the likelihood that someone will recognize her, the clay reconstruction is photographed with distinctly different looks. We decided that we we're going to put those photographs onto a poster and distribute it to key public locations, including the chain of grocery stores from which the killer had obtained the plastic bags used to wrap the victim's body parts. We needed to get this out to as many people as we could. Over the next two months, the poster is seen by tens of thousands of people in Wisconsin and surrounding states. We tracked down many leads. But to investigators' growing frustration. Every single one was ultimately eliminated my feeling was that I, we just needed one person to see that clay reconstruction. Ultimately, the whole case was going to boil down to only one fruitful lead. Then, on a cold November morning in the nearby town of Westby, a woman is shopping in a grocery store. She was using the ATM. She happened to look up, and she saw the poster and the face of someone she recognizes. Then she read it and she saw that it was a missing person and was the victim of a homicide. Horrified, the woman anonymously calls police. What's the address of She thought that it was actually a picture of her ex-husband's first cousin from Tanzania, Africa. The caller tells investigators that she believes the missing woman is Muevano Kupaza, we had a name that was being given to us, but we still didn't know if that was really Muvana Kupaza. It was one of the many leads, so we didn't want to put too much hope. The detectives checked the name in the public records. There was a Muvano Kupaza who lived in Madison, Wisconsin, which was approximately a half hour travel time from where the torso was located. She attended Wisconsin English as a second language school in Madison. Investigators show the poster to her classmates. Every one of them said, that looks like Movano. But the 25-year-old is rumored to have left Madison to return to her hometown in Tanzania. Now we have these pictures. People started to wonder, whoa, something here is not right. Her cousin Peter told her friends that Movano had traveled by bus to Iowa. To meet up with a former teacher friend of his from Tanzania. Peter said the two had arranged to then fly home together. Did the young woman's journey end in Africa or on the banks of the Wisconsin River? Muevano had come to America with big dreams. To advance herself, get education, and hopefully start her own life as an independent woman. She had been sponsored by her cousin, Peter Kupaza. She was new, she didn't know the place, so she was depending on her cousin to lead her into the prosperity. She trusted him that he would take care of her 
just as her parents had taken care of him after Peter lost his father at the age of eight. They were raised as almost like brother and sister, not just cousins. Is it possible that poor Movano fell prey to her killer after Peter dropped her off at the bus station? Certainly, we want to talk to Peter Kupaza. But first, they want to identify the woman who'd seen the poster and contacted police. There was a divorce proceeding in Dane County involving Peter Kupaza and his now ex-wife, Sherry Goss. Once we have the name Sherry Goss, we suspected that she was likely the anonymous caller. Curious about her desire for secrecy. Detective Welch and I immediately traveled to Westby to interview her. Goss admits to being the caller, but says she didn't want to be identified given her bitter and painful divorce from Peter. Sherry Goss told us that she worked as a missionary and had gone to Tanzania with her church group. Peter was her tutor for her to learn Swahili. Peter wanted to marry her. Sherry brought her new husband to the United States, and the couple settled in Madison. Peter Kupaza then asked to bring Muvano. Sherry did know a little bit of Swahili, so Sherry and Muvano got along, and Sherry tried to look after her as well as she could until the divorce and ultimate separation. But Sherry hasn't now seen Muvano in over a year. Sherry didn't know where she was living. Or whether she had left for Africa. She knows only that Movano looks like the girl on the poster. And she has a picture of Movano to prove it. Although the resemblance to the reconstructed model is uncanny. We don't know with absolute certainty that it is Movano. But what Sherry reveals about Peter and Movano's relationship may change the course of the entire investigation. She did not feel that he treated her as a relative. Detectives believe the mystery woman found in the Wisconsin River could be Muevano Kupaza. She had been brought over by her cousin, Peter Kupaza, who was Sherry Goss's ex-husband. For Sherry Goss, red flags started to go up shortly after Muevano's arrival. She was suspicious of Peter's attitude toward his young cousin. Peter would somewhat keep her in seclusion. Peter was um, very controlling, very domineering, possessive of Lovano. She did not feel that he treated her as a relative. Then, Goss drops a bombshell. Sherry ultimately learned that Peter was sexually assaulting Lovano. Sherry Goss left Peter and filed for divorce, but Movano's situation worsened. Movano, in fact, had gotten pregnant by Peter. Sherry Goss was contacted by members of the Tanzanian community who advised her that Peter had taken Movano for an abortion. A shocked Sherry Goss attempted to help her. She did a follow-up visit with Planned Parenthood with Movano. Goss advised the young woman to return home. Under the circumstances, Muvano did not want to go back to Tanzania, given the fact that she had an abortion. She would not have been welcomed within her own people, within her own village. A dark story that may have had an even darker ending. It started to point fingers at the person who had abused her. But before police can deal with Peter Kupaza, they must first prove beyond a doubt that the body is that of his young cousin. It was our goal to match our victim to Movano Kupaza if, in fact, it was her. If fingerprints taken from the victim's body are a match to those of Movano, investigators will have finally identified their mystery woman. But how to get prints from a missing person? The team hits on an idea. So we went looking for some documents that we knew Movano had touched at a health clinic. The very clinic Movano had gone to for her abortion. Initially, we didn't know if there were fingerprints on those documents. We had hoped there were. But it's a long shot. Many people besides Movano have handled them. When I obtained the documents, I wore gloves. I asked the staff who retrieved the documents to wear gloves. When forensic experts process the forms, fingerprints suddenly emerge. 
but will any of them prove a match to those of the murdered woman? We took the fingerprints to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. There are other cases pending before ours, but we're waiting with bated breath. We're very eager to hear the results. While they wait, investigators dig deeper. Trying to get information in advance of actually interviewing Peter. It was important for us to think about motivation. Perhaps the fact that Peter had learned Wovano had spoken out about his abuse. She went to someone in the community for help, and she revealed what was going on. She said Peter wanted to sleep with her. The abuse made even more shameful by the way in which their relationship is viewed in Tanzanian culture. Since Peter and Muivano were cousins, Peter would consider Muivano as his sister. And by our tradition, you don't mess up with your sister. And Peter knows his actions could have dire consequences for him. If people harbor animosity against what he did, he won't be safe. He couldn't risk sending her back to Tanzania. But keeping her here was becoming a burden. Peter had been evicted several times from residences. He had not paid his lease on his vehicle. And financially, she was becoming quite a drain on him. With no use for Movano, did Peter make a plan to coldly dispose of her? At the same time that Movano probably was still living with him, he actually was in communications with another young woman on the eastern seaboard trying to encourage her to come see him. In January of 2000, six months after the discovery of Jane Doe, the detectives get the call they've been waiting for. I was actually driving in my car. I, I remember exactly where I was. The fingerprints confirm it. The body is that of Movano Kupaza. Investigators have finally identified their mystery woman. I was so excited I nearly drove off the road. I was absolutely elated. We hit the ground running now. We had a face, and we now had the name to the face, and, and we were going to look for the person that killed her. But before the investigators question Peter Kupaza, they pay another visit to his ex-wife, Sherry Goss. This time, they bring with them the black bag found at the crime scene, the bag that had contained Muvano's torso. We actually showed her the duffel bag. Goss is visibly shocked. She told us that she had purchased a duffel bag just like that for Peter. Coincidence or irrefutable proof of a despicable crime? To find out, the detectives must finally come face to face with Peter Kupaza. My gut was telling me this man killed and dismembered Movano Kupaza. Investigators seeking the killer of Movano Kupaza have been led to the doorstep of her cousin, Peter. We had a search warrant in our possession at that time because if he was involved in the death, we couldn't rely on him consenting to a search. But Peter agrees to talk to the detectives. Peter seemed generally cooperative, somewhat nervous. He was questioned about Movano's whereabouts, and it was framed to him as it was a welfare check because people were concerned about where she might be. The detectives show Peter the facial reconstruction of the victim to gauge his reaction. We asked him, does this look like anybody you know? And he looked at it for uh, a very short time, and he thoughtfully said, no, it doesn't look like anybody I know. All of the African community were saying that looked exactly like Movano. And yet the person who knew her best declared that there was no way you could tell that that was Movano. That was a big red flag to both uh, Detective Welch and I. The first of many. Peter told us that Movano left Madison to return to Tanzania. That he, in fact, was the one who helped her to go. Peter provided her with $1,500 in cash. He said her plan was to go by bus to Iowa, then fly with a friend home to Africa. Last time he had said he saw her was at the bus stop in Madison. What's more, according to Peter. Movano's father assured Peter that Movano returned and that she was healthy and happy and living in Tanzania. 
Peter Kupaza has been caught in a bold-faced lie. Lies just reaffirm what our suspicions were, and he gave us many, many lies. Peter told us during this interview initially that Mavano was never in this apartment. Later in the interview, that story changed a bit, and that, well, she had never lived there, but she'd actually been there. She came to visit many times. She would come to do her laundry. And then again, it continued to change. She would only come over sometimes just to shower. But she actually had never lived there. But there's one thing Kupaza is clear about. He had said that there were no possessions of, of hers at his house. That's when detectives pull out their search warrant. Combing through the apartment, they are distressed at what they find. There were multiple belongings of Movanos that were found, shoes, jewelry, bags that she would have used to pack to travel in. Most notably, her Bible that many people in the community said she wouldn't leave without. Investigators also find Movanos' hymnal. As part of the culture for Tanzania, when they turn 13 or 14 years old, that's given to them as part of them becoming an adult in the church. She would have taken them with her as some of her most prized and personal belongings. Despite the evidence, Peter insists that Movano returned to Africa in April, but a letter addressed to her tells police otherwise. They were able to develop a fingerprint of Movano Kupaza just below the postmark, which was dated of June of 1999. But the most spine-chilling evidence against Peter Kupaza is yet to come. When you open the closet, on the floor was a collection of grocery bags from the same store that Movano's body had been packaged in. The detectives have seen and heard enough. We arrested Peter Kupaza at that time based on blatant untruths that he told us in the interview. He was arrested for the homicide and concealing the corpse of Movano Kupaza. But with the evidence against Kupaza largely circumstantial, investigators call in crime scene experts to search the apartment looking for proof of Peter's guilt. They pour over every inch of the bathroom. Found blood behind the baseboard right next to the bathtub. That blood was able to be DNA matched to Movano Kupaza. But a single drop of her blood is hardly evidence of her gruesome murder. Because this body had been dismembered, uh, there would have been a large amount of blood that would have had to have been dealt with. Had the killer in his cleanup left minute traces of his evil work behind, investigators hope the cadaver dog, Eagle, can live up to his name. The dog zeroes in on the bathroom and finds the blood investigators are looking for. Along the base of the toilet, bathtub stall, and along the base of the wall. In the kitchen... He indicated on a cutting board, two knives. Then he leads investigators to the closet. Eagle was alerting on the door pulls, so we speculated that Peter Kupaza may have had blood on his fingers when he went into the closet, touched the door pulls to obtain the plastic bags. The dog finds still more traces on the tools used to clean up. We also took Eagle to the underground parking structure where Peter parked his car. He went directly to Peter Kupaza's vehicle and alerted on the trunk. Now we're certain that Peter Kupaza was involved in the death or at least the dismemberment of Movano Kupaza. But that may not be enough to keep him behind bars. We had no cause of death. We had no place of death. We had no date of death. Will the man police are sure is Movano's killer convince a jury to set him free? I did not do this. Six months after the body parts of Movano Kupaza are found floating in the Wisconsin River, her cousin Peter Kupaza is taken into custody. He was caught in several lies during the course of this interview. My gut was telling me this man killed and dismembered Movano Kupaza. On June 12, 2000, the trial of Peter Kupaza gets underway in a Sauk County courtroom. 
Among the spectators are Peter's ex-wife, Sherry Goss, and Wavano's parents, who've come from Tanzania to watch the proceedings. They wanted to see the evidence for themselves to know what happened to their daughter, finally and forever. Their profound grief made worse by the fact that the person accused of killing Movano is a man they'd raised as their son. I would like to, for my parents to know that I didn't do this horrible act to my sister. The prosecution will be hard pressed to prove otherwise. We had no place of death. We had no date of death. We had no cause of death. Much of our information is circumstantial evidence. And Kupaza's defense lawyers need only to show reasonable doubt. Can the prosecution team, despite the odds, convince a jury of Peter Kupaza's guilt? They begin by establishing Kupaza's means for killing, then skillfully dismembering Wovano's body. In Tanzania, every family raises a few animals. He would have been involved in part of that ritualistic preparation of the animals by butchering them. Part of that butchering includes disarticulating at the joints. As for his motive for killing his cousin. Peter Kupaza could no longer afford to keep Movano in the United States, but he couldn't really risk sending her back home either. But what about the third element, opportunity? The evidence that Movano frequented Peter's home provides the final pillar in the prosecution's case. We thought that he had killed Movano while she was in the shower and dismembered her there. In closing, the prosecution paints a picture of a man incapable of telling the truth. Peter Kupaza lied, and he built his lies on top of his lies upon more lies. Peter Kupaza really firmed up our case for us with those lies. And there's no reason to lie unless she had something to cover up. And he did. He had killed his cousin. To the end, Peter Kupaza denies it. I don't know what to say, but I would like to tell you today that I did not do this. But does the jury believe him? After nine hours of deliberation, they return with a verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Peter T. Kupaza, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide. Peter Kupaza is sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Movano. She was somebody that was never intended to be discovered or given justice, and yet she was. While Movano is mourned by her family back in Tanzania, it is her small community in Madison where she is finally laid to rest. When I remember Movano, what I most remember is her beautiful, quiet, shy smile. When she would smile, she could light up the room. The humanity of this case really tugs at your heart because she came here as such an innocent person. One of the evenings, we had dinner with the family, and they sang for us from the hymnal that Movano had in Tanzania. It's the most beautiful thing I've probably ever heard. We were very gratified that the family did have justice for their daughter. In a remote northern city, a 52-year-old nurse goes missing from her home. My gut screaming. And I said, somebody else has done things in here. Who might have kidnapped her and why? It was sickening to think about. To track her abductor, investigators use every forensic tool available. But the vicious assailant remains at large. You just want to reach out and get hold of the guy. He was trying to lure her into the car. I just got shivers up and down my spine. Will the monster who'd killed before kill again? Anchorage, Alaska, 
The largest community north of the 60th parallel is, in many ways, still a frontier town. A place that appeals to those in search of adventure, like 52-year-old Mindy Schloss. Mindy was a very strong woman. She was very independent. Mindy had moved to Alaska in the 1980s for what was supposed to be a short stay. More than 20 years later, she's still here and working as a psychiatric nurse. My relationship with Mindy actually started uh, as a co-worker. We were both employed as nurses. We traveled around the States. Jerry couldn't ask for a better workmate. Mindy was very professional. She was very timely. If you weren't five minutes early for a meeting, you were late. She was very responsible. As far as a work ethic, most people give 100%. Mindy gave 110. It wasn't long before Mindy and Jerry became best friends. She would sometimes call me mom. And it was because of the closeness that we sort of took care of each other. And when Mindy took the hour-long flight from Anchorage to Fairbanks twice a month for work, Jerry took care of Mindy's cat. Willie required medication. So when Mindy was gone, I would go over every day and give Willie his medicine. The first week of August 2007 wasn't supposed to be any different. I was expecting to get with Mindy before she left for Fairbanks, but I called Saturday and I left a message and she didn't call back. And so I sort of thought, well, she's busy doing things and getting ready to go. Jerry continues to try and get in touch with Mindy all weekend, and she's not the only one. Mindy's longtime friend, Bob Conway, has also been trying to reach her. I called her cell phone and I got to the voicemail box was full. And that just never happened. That's when I, when I contacted Jerry. He asked if I had heard from Mindy, and I said no, and she hadn't returned his calls. And that alarmed both of us, because of all the people in Mindy's world, she kept in touch with the two of us more than anyone. I knew there was something really wrong. I didn't know which way to turn. I didn't know what to think. You, you don't know where to begin. You don't know where to look. Early the following morning, Jerry heads over to Mindy's to feed the cat and have a look around the house. She's concerned by what she sees. Mindy was very orderly. She was a little bit almost compulsive about how she liked her house to be and look. And basically, the house looked as if she'd walked out the door and hadn't got ready for the week. Jerry heads downstairs to give Willie his medication. But as she's leaving, the door was extremely loose, so I got a screwdriver and tightened up the doorknob and shut it and locked it and went to work. When Jerry gets to her office, she places a call to Fairbanks. And her supervisor came on the phone and she said, Jerry, I'm a little concerned. Mindy didn't show up for work this morning. That hit my button. So much so, she contacts police. I was driving home and my sergeant called and said that there was a suspicious missing person case and asked if I could come back into the station and take a look at the case. It isn't long before Pam is doing a walkthrough with Jerry of Mindy's home. To me, the house did not look unusual. There was no sign whatsoever of burglary. She was a traveling nurse, and so she went out to the villages, and she had just beautiful carvings in her home, things that were, you know, worth quite a bit of money. And as a nurse practitioner... She had medication in the house that would have been desirable to somebody that broke in. She had prescription pads. None of it had been touched. It just didn't look like somebody had come in to the home or that a struggle had happened in the home. But it's the small things that have caught Jerry's attention. Well, there were a bunch of bills on the table that were half made out. There was an empty bottle of wine sitting on the kitchen counter. And when I walked into the bedroom, the bed was clean, made, really tight, needy corners. And anybody that knows Mindy knows Mindy would not have her bed that way. Mindy was a restless sleeper. She never tucked anything in. Jerry pointed out many things that were unusual in the house. At that point, we looked in the garage and the car was gone. And I said, Mindy would never drive her car. She lived so close to the airport and there was no reason for her to park uh, in storage. She would always catch a taxi to uh, the airport when she'd leave. Jerry's intuition was telling her loud and clear. Things weren't right. And I said, somebody else has done things in here. Had Mindy opened her door to a ruthless abductor? 
She told her friend she felt uncomfortable around him, that she thought he was creepy. And he was actually the last person to see Mindy alive. 52-year-old Anchorage psychiatric nurse Mindy Schloss hasn't been heard from for days. I felt something horrible and it happened to Mindy. And we just didn't know what. While the forensic team uses tape lifts to trap evidence left by the one who may have abducted her, Detective Pam Pernu turns her attention to Bob Conway, Mindy's on-again, off-again boyfriend. Could he be responsible for her disappearance? To try and find out where Bob Conway was for sure, we contacted his place of employment and got his work records, what times he was working. You know, I wasn't really happy they were looking at me. But I knew they were pursuing every angle, so I guess in a way you're, you're thankful a little bit for that. But Detective Pernu is able to confirm that Bob was out of town when Mindy vanished. But might she have been seeing someone else? Mindy would do um, online dating, and so occasionally she would have a date through that. Pernu takes a close look at Mindy's most recent computer activities. Although she finds no evidence of online dating, Pernu can see when Mindy last accessed the internet. We knew it was Mindy on her computer because we could look to see the different sites that she was going on and sites that um, were related to nursing. So we could put her at her house on the internet up until 1.30 a.m. on August 4th. What happened to Mindy after that? In the hopes that someone may have seen her or her vehicle, police distribute photos of both to local TV outlets. There were a lot of people calling in saying that they had seen Mindy in different places. A Fred Meyer store in Eagle River, some as far away as Texas. Will any of them turn out to be true? Detectives were trying to follow up every single tip that came in. So we just needed a lot of people. Anchorage police appeal to the FBI's special agent, Michael Thorson, for help. So you have to try to determine maybe did they plan a trip. So taking a look at transactions on a credit card, did she go to Walmart and buy a tent? Try to identify maybe you, if she was planning on something and just didn't tell anybody. But investigators find no indication Mindy had any plans to leave town. I never thought that she had just gone somewhere else. I didn't know if she was sick or hurt or in the hospital somewhere. I started thinking in my mind, had she gone out Sunday doing something, walking, hiking, berry picking? If she passed out, the potential is, could have she fallen and hit her head? Either a bear got her or she's lost or something. So, I mean, I immediately contacted some fellow workers that were down in that neighborhood, and they, they shut the job down and went and combed the whole Seward Highway that very afternoon. But when they find no sign of her, Bob Conway grows increasingly worried that something sinister has happened to Mindy, and he's determined to find out what. Drove rivers, looked through ditches, and they looked through dumpsters. I mean, I just, I did, it's just horrible. And while police do a search of Mindy's neighborhood. I called Mindy's bank and I asked them if there was any unusual activity on Mindy's debit card. The answer is yes there was a large cash withdrawal at an early morning hour, which was not typical for Mindy. Investigators request the bank's surveillance tape and are distressed to see a masked man accessing her account. He has a bandana on, has a quilted jacket. He performs a balance inquiry. Then he puts his hand up to his face and pulls down the bandana just long enough for him to be able to type in, see whatever he needs to see. They can see basically from his nose down to his chin. Could this split second glimpse help lead police to the masked man? And then we see him gets the money, turn around and exit. And at that time, we can definitely see he is wearing a backpack. This is something that we definitely would be able to identify if we can find it again. Are there other clues the investigators can glean? On that particular day, being in the um, first part of August, it still would have been 60s in Alaska, and people people in Alaska 60s is, is, is 100 degrees in Phoenix. And the person had a very large jacket on, would have been described as a winter quilted jacket. Again, he's trying to hide his body frame. Who is this man, and what's his involvement in Mindy Schloss's disappearance? I thought, well, I'll gather Mindy's friends and show them this photo. I, when I saw that guy, I got a very sickening feeling. I just got shivers up and down my spine. 
but none of Mindy's friends could identify the man. Could Mindy's activities in the days prior to her disappearance offer investigators a clue? I found out from one of her friends that Mindy was having work done in her home. So she was calling in contractors to give her quotes. Mindy got into an argument with one of the contractors about his price, and she told her friends she felt uncomfortable around him, that she thought he was creepy. Investigators track the man down, but he comes up clean. Pernu then questions another contractor who'd met with Mindy Schloss the very night she went missing. It was about 7 p.m. that he was there. And he was extremely nervous about talking to us. But his story, too, checks out. We didn't find out anything unusual in his past. And he didn't see anybody else at Mindy's home when he was there. Will a new ATM video lead investigators to Mindy's real abductor? Our worst fears were confirmed at that point. I knew that she was probably dead. It's been 48 hours since Anchorage resident Mindy Schloss was reported missing, and four days since anyone has heard from her. Now investigators have learned of a second withdrawal from her bank account made in the early morning hours. The video was good enough that we can see what appears to be the same exact jacket that he had on the first ATM withdrawal. Again, wearing a bandana, but interesting with that one, looking at the video, we see him, again, perform the balance inquiry, withdraws the maximum amount of $500 as you can do each day, and he walks out. Well, not a few minutes later, he walks back into the lobby, goes back up to the ATM machine. He looked very agitated walking around, tugging on the bandana, arranging his clothes. What could have happened to so upset him? And so I contacted the security officer for that bank. I asked him to take a look at the machine. He took a look at the machine and found a card. Sure enough, that card belonged to Mindy Schloss. The man had forgotten the card when he left, and the machine, for security's sake, had swallowed it up again. So he walked back in, and of course, I'm now thinking he's trying everything he can possibly do. He's frantic at this point because it's not like he can show up at the bank and say, I lost my card when his name's not Mindy Sloss. If the first withdrawal hadn't convinced Pam Pernu of Mindy's fate, the second withdrawal has. I knew that she was probably dead. Can investigators determine who may have killed her without tipping their hand by releasing their surveillance photo to the general public? So I went to the bank and I asked for all the transactions before and after his, hoping maybe we might have a witness that saw a car leaving, may be able to give us a good description on a car that we can try to hunt down the possible suspect here. Will police, for the first time in this investigation, get lucky? We had a person who, at you know 4.30 in the morning, he decided that he needed to use the ATM machine. And when he drove up, he saw a man outside. What was interesting is he said this male was on a bicycle. Might the bike be a clue to the man's identity? Police canvass Mindy's neighborhood again in search of anything that will lead them to her or her abductor. When was the last time you saw your neighbor Mindy? What do you know about her? And then asking them, is there a house in the neighborhood that there are problems with. One house that kept that coming up a little bit strange was a house right next to Mindy Schloss's house. The neighbors would just say, there are parties all the time. It is a problem house for this neighborhood. Investigators pay a visit to the home. There was a number of people living there, younger people, and they didn't want to provide a lot of information. Pernu then speaks to the woman who lives on the opposite side of the problem house. I felt that she was holding something back. I thought, you know, she seems like a very, a very good person, and she just isn't answering the question. Does the woman know something about Mindy's disappearance? And if so, why won't she say? The next day I got a call from her, and she said that she had more information that she would like to give me, but she did not want me to come to her home, that she was afraid. So I went to meet her at work, and what she told me was that before we got to her house that evening, a man that lived in the house next door came over to her residence, 
she said that she knew him as Josh. And when he came over, he said to her, the police are in the neighborhood now. And he said, I do not want you to tell them that I live here. And she asked him why, you know, he said because he was on probation and that he did not want to get arrested. The woman didn't mention him to police that day, but later that night, home alone. She heard somebody walking around on her porch. So she snuck through the house, went and looked out a window just in time to see Josh. And she said that scared her. So much so. She finally relents and tells us his last name. And she says, it's Joshua Wade. I immediately recognized his name. Joshua Wade is infamous for any law enforcement officer in the state of Alaska because of his acquittal of a murder in which a Alaska native was brutally murdered and beat with a rock to death. It was a horrible murder. But because Wade could be charged only with evidence tampering in Della Brown's death. He had served a very short time in prison and that he had been released. But I was convinced from what I knew that he had murdered Della Brown and gotten away with it. Even though 12 people said I was not guilty, everybody thinks I'm guilty. Is he also guilty of abducting, maybe even killing Mindy Schloss? Investigators mount an all-out search for the now free 27-year-old. From the information that we were getting from the roommates, which wasn't much, we didn't think that he had a car. They told us that he traveled mostly by bike or he walked. And they just claimed that they hadn't seen him lately. Those who have seen him fear he's hiding something terrible, like the mother of Christina Greaser, one of Josh's friends. My first impression when my daughter walked in with Josh into my home was I was very angry, given his past history from what my daughter had told me that he was a neighbor of Mindy's. I, I felt very nervous, very scared. I was concerned about him lashing out and doing something to somebody else. Can scent dogs, despite the odds, track down the could-be killer? In this case, we were weeks old. You have traffic, you have cars, you have wind, you have everything that's destroying that scent. Investigators are distraught to learn that 27-year-old Joshua Wade, acquitted seven years earlier for the savage murder of Della Brown, is living in the house next door to missing Anchorage nurse Mindy Schloss. It would have been ridiculous of me to not immediately think that Josh Wade had something to do with Mindy's disappearance. We need to get him off the street and do what we can to build a case against Josh Wade. And on August 9th, one week after Mindy Schloss and her vehicle were last seen, police get a call from an observant local truck driver. And he told me when he was out at the airport, he drove by and he saw the, the back end of a car that looked like Mindy's to him. And he said, I was going to just drive on past, but I thought, no, I better back up and take another look. And he backed up, and he said he saw the license plate, and he said he just started shaking. Sure enough. It's Mindy's car. And it was very strange because it was approximately about a mile away from the airport. There would be no reason why Mindy would park her car in that lot if she was going to go on a trip somewhere. Police on the scene search the car but find no sign of Mindy. But we go and we see that there's video cameras there in the, in the parking lot. So we reviewed the video and we saw what looked to be a man driving Mindy's car in about 12.45 on August 4th, uh, parking the car. Gets out, shuts the door, looks like he's wiping down the car for fingerprints, and then you see him walking away. As he's walking away, it looks to be a male wearing a backpack. Can't quite determine it, but it sure looks like that same backpack that was used at that first ATM transaction at Wells Fargo. Is this the man who abducted Mindy? And if it is Josh Wade, had he left any proof of that behind? We need to do whatever we can to try to determine if there's any evidence in that car. The crime scene team took swabs from the steering wheel and the gear shift, uh, checking for DNA, and processed the car for fingerprints. Inside the car, there was a shoe impression that was found in dirt, all kind of sideways, like someone who was laying in the car. 
Investigators are all but certain that passenger was Mindy. We find Mindy Sloss's purse. I go through the purse. Her ATM card's missing. In addition to the physical evidence found at the scene, investigators search for the less tangible using a scent transfer machine. It's a small vacuum cleaner type device. It can collect scent off of hard service like a steering wheel or a uh, the stick shift in the car, places that the individual that was driving Mindy's car would have touched. The forensic team pays particular attention to the driver's seat. Because we wanted to isolate scent from the subject versus passengers that had been in the car. Armed now with the abductor's scent, the FBI calls in the canines. I was very skeptical of the scent dogs and what they were telling me that they could do including tracking the man who used Mindy Schloss's bank card from this ATM to wherever his scent leads them. Even Michael Thorson is hedging his bets. Let's go ahead and try, but we weren't holding our breath. Tracking dogs are typically used immediately after a crime. So for example, in a bank robbery, they're going to follow scent immediately after from that location. Not only was this trail weeks old, you have traffic, you have cars, you have wind, you have everything that's destroying that scent. And for that scent to still be on the ground. The tracking dog was presented with scent at the ATM, and it was a scent taken from Mindy's car. That dog then walked out, walked down the street, about three and a half blocks, walked over to Mindy's house. And went up the front steps of Mindy's house and sniffed at the door handle and on the stairs, and then came down the stairs uh, and went around the fence to the house immediately next to Mindy's house. The home of investigators' number one suspect, Josh Wade. The dog then provides its signal and says, I'm telling you, this is where the scent leads. I was pretty shocked. The first thing I did was call Detective Pernu on the phone. When Jolene called me and told me what the dog had done, I couldn't believe it. I wanted to see it for myself. Pam Pernu will soon get that chance when the FBI lets loose the scent dog at the second location where Mindy's bank card was used. He crosses one of the major intersections. APD cars are having to race ahead to stop traffic because the dog just doesn't stop. It ends up going almost three and a half miles through the middle of Anchorage City to Josh Wade's house. It was just incredible. But catching Josh Wade will prove a lot more dangerous than police and the public could imagine. She said that on the phone, she went through the pictures and she saw a hand holding a gun. So I told her, you need to be very careful because I'm sure he's looking for you. Armed with a search warrant, investigators are closing in on the home of Josh Wade, their number one suspect in the abduction and probable murder of Mindy Schloss. And the SWAT team went into the residence because uh, Josh Wade is obviously considered very dangerous. Though the search team finds no sign of Josh Wade, they do find evidence they hope will help with the investigator's case. That included uh, a jacket that appeared to match the jacket that the individual at the ATM wore. So when I took it over to the lab, they then conducted in an examination of the jacket. They found a Credit Union One receipt a $500 withdrawal at the exact same time and place as the ATM withdrawal was done at the credit union one. I thought it was incredibly stupid that he left the receipt in the jacket that he wore to withdraw Mindy Schloss's money out of her account. Criminals make mistakes every single day, and that's why law enforcement was able to catch him. The SWAT team moves on in search of still more evidence of Wade's guilt. They went into this closet and noticed that there was a attic access. So as one officer is pushing the other officer up into the attic, he scrapes along the wall with his gear. They saw and heard something fall from the inside door jam of the closet. And a watch falls on the ground. And that happened to be a lady's watch. But does it belong to Mindy? As soon as I saw the watch, I called Jerry, Mindy's really good friend. She had described to me before some of the jewelry that Mindy wore. She's like a nurse like me. We're old school nurses, you know, you always wore a watch. Jerry told me that she knew the watch was gold. She said that Mindy was very small. She was a very petite woman, and so 
the circumference of the watch would be really small. I knew at that point then that Mindy was no longer alive. But can they finally find her body? It was very urgent. Pretty soon after that, it was going to start snowing, and we may never find it at that point. It's very, very difficult to prosecute somebody for a homicide if you don't have the body of the victim. Each minute, each day that goes on, evidence can get destroyed. Is Josh Wade destined to escape a murder conviction, just as he did in the death of Della Brown? Much will depend on the results of the DNA samples taken from the inside of Mindy Schloss's car. The state of Alaska, through the governor's office, actually put some pressure on to get this DNA done immediately. When we received the, the results from the state of Alaska lab, it confirmed that the DNA on the steering wheel was a match to Josh Wade. We immediately released to the public that we were looking for Josh Wade as a person of interest in the disappearance of Mindy Schloss. There were posters that were made, put all over town. Two major billboards are placed in Anchorage, providing reward for his arrest. Everybody in law enforcement was looking for Josh Wade. This was one of the biggest manhunts that we've had in Alaska. And investigators are feeling the pressure. I was pretty concerned about him lashing out and doing something to somebody else. There was a lot of fear, a lot of concern that he was uh, he was out in the community and that we didn't have him arrested. Police receive hundreds of tips from the public, but Wade continues to elude investigators. For the next week or so, we were just missing him. It was almost like a cat and mouse game. We were knocking on people's doors that knew him, that were associated with him, and it always seemed that he was here and he was close, but we were just always a couple of minutes behind him. We released the photograph that we had taken from the uh, bank at the ATM of Josh Wade wearing the hat and the bandana over his face. Although there is very little of his face visible, one woman is sure she knows him. Her name is Lisa, and she's an old girlfriend of Wade's. She said that she recognized the person in the ATM photo as Josh, but she wouldn't talk to us again after that. But there is another woman in Josh Wade's circle looking to come clean. Christina Greaser, who is about to provide police with their most promising tip yet. She called and she said that she had been driving him around um, over the past few weeks and that at some point he left a backpack in her car. When my daughter informed me that he left the backpack, we both started going through it. There was a lot of bank receipts. There was a cell phone in there. She said that on the phone, she went through the pictures and she saw a picture of a hand holding a gun. Christina said that she thought that that was Josh Wade's hand and that the gun looked like a gun that he, she had seen him with. A Glock 45 caliber handgun. Tina Greaser tells her daughter to contact police immediately. So she did. She came into the Anchorage Police Department and we got the backpack from her. But will she help police with their investigation? What we wanted her to do was to uh, participate in recording conversations between herself and Josh Wade. Afraid for her life, she refuses to cooperate further. When Christina stopped working with us, I told her, you need to be very careful. Um, you know, you he knows that you have that backpack. And you need to be very careful, because I'm sure he's looking for you. The next thing I knew is my daughter had called me and said, Mom, Josh is outside my house. Can investigators catch Josh Wade before he kills again? He was literally moving from one person's house to the next, trying to stay ahead of law enforcement. The man police believe murdered Mindy Schloss has suddenly appeared at the home of Christina Greaser, demanding she return his backpack. He had a lot of anger in his voice, and he was also cursing at my daughter at that point. Wade insists Christina give him a ride somewhere safe from police, but she refuses to help him. She tried to get him to stick around, but he got suspicious and started walking away. And what my daughter did is she ended up getting in her vehicle and following Josh through the neighborhood. She had the direct number of one of the SWAT guys, so she called him directly and said, 
He's here. I can see him. The officers were close by, so they got into the area. To their dismay, however, Josh Wade has already found his way into a nearby apartment building. I drove down the highway basically as fast as is legally possible, and I arrive on the scene where he's at. Police officers are out with the shotguns. Everywhere you walk, there's a police officer. And I speak with the SWAT team leader, who advises that currently he's in negotiations with Josh Wade because there are two people that he's holding hostage in this apartment. All we wanted to do was arrest him so that he couldn't hurt anybody else. So it was very frustrating. Will the man who has eluded police for weeks surrender? To the investigator's relief. Wade finally did give himself up. He opened up the door to the apartment. We took custody of him and then escorted him from the apartment to an awaiting police car. I was very happy, very relieved, and I just wanted to see if we could try and talk to him. But Wade will be a tough nut to crack. He knows the system. He knows the game. He has an attitude. I can see he's just going to tell me that he wants his lawyer and he just wants to go to jail. So knowing we only have one shot at this, I tell Pam, I said, let's go in. Hi, I'm Pam Pernu with APD. And we want to uh, let you know what's going on. We started to tell him why he was under arrest. You going to talk with us at all, or are you just going to sit there? You going to do the silent treatment? Do you want to talk with us? About what? About uh, what you've been arrested for? I have no idea what I've been arrested for, man. You've been arrested for two counts of bank fraud, aggravated identity theft, and access device fraud. He says, well, what What do you mean by the device fraud? What the f is that? That is uh, bank fraud, which means that you used an uh, ATM card of somebody that's not yourself and that uh, that person did not give you permission to do so. And Josh says, you're assuming that. You guys assume all this? No, we don't assume. We have a little bit more than assume. I mean, we actually talked to Mindy, you know. She told us that you didn't have permission to use her ATM card. Mm -hmm. There was that pregnant pause, and he had this, what I call a smirk. He had this little smile on his face. What did you just say? And you could see in his eyes he was reliving what he did. He knew that we didn't talk to Mindy because he had killed her. Are you guys trying to play games with me, man? To me, it said, I got away with it once, and I'm going to get away with it again. I'm my attorney, dude. And at that point, we had to terminate the interview. But I had enough to know he killed Mindy. But without Mindy's body, prosecutors can charge Wade only with bank fraud. Investigators continue the frantic search for their victim. It's getting cold, leaves are dropping, and we know that if we don't find Mindy's body immediately, the snow will cover it, and it will forever not be found. Six weeks after Mindy goes missing, and just as it seems Josh is once again about to get away with murder, an electric company employee discovers the remains of a woman in a wooded area more than an hour's drive from Anchorage. And so myself and the Anchorage Police Department are contacted, and then we go out on scene. They are horrified to see the body of Mindy Schloss. Mindy was laying on her back, and she was in the middle of the woods. I thought how horrifying, how, how terrified she must have been. The forensic team does a thorough examination of the scene. Underneath her head, we found a shell casing. The shell casing was a 45 caliber Federal cartridge, same caliber as seen in the hand of Josh. With a heavy heart, Pam Pernu contacts Bob Conway. I told Pam, you know, when they did find her, to to come to me first. And then I wanted to go see Jerry. I had a knock on the door, and it was about 11 o'clock at night. It was Bob and Pam there. And seeing them, I knew. Um, sorry. It was reality at that point. You know, you couldn't convince yourself any other way. They'd found her body. But can they prove Josh Wade is the one who murdered her? What we don't have 
We weren't able to find any evidence that would put Josh at that body site. It's extremely important. So they wanted to bring the dogs back up so that we could see maybe what path Josh Wade took to take Mindy into the woods. They take the dogs to a cul-de-sac not far from where Mindy's body was discovered. It's a location where we assumed the car would have been parked. They then present the dog with scent taken directly from Josh Wade. And the dog ran onto the trail that went up to the area where Mindy's body was found and came back out to the road and ran down the road, which would have been the exit that Josh would have made in the, in the vehicle. A second dog is presented with Mindy Schloss's scent. The dog tracked from the cul-de-sac area back on the path and directly to where her body was found and then didn't do anything else. It sat down as if that's the end of the track. It was eerie. You see there was five or six police officers and FBI agents there, and then everybody's silent seeing this dog walk the same path that Mindy walked and then stops right where she was killed. Can police convince Josh Wade's brand new bride to help bring him to justice? She says, I have everything. He confessed to me. But I do not want to talk to you about what I know. Investigators on the Mindy Schloss murder are slowly building their case against 27-year-old Josh Wade, who'd escaped justice years earlier for the savage killing of Della Brown. We can show that Josh used Mindy's ATM card. Josh used her car. We were able to place uh, Josh Wade at the location where Mindy's body was recovered. But investigators still have nothing that places Josh Wade at Mindy's home. We knew that Mindy was in the house on the night that she disappeared and that she was taken from her house. And it was important for us to put him in the house just to, to complete the picture of what happened. Will the DNA results from Mindy's home provide police with what they need? During the first search of Mindy's house, the crime scene team went in and they used tape lifts to basically lift up everything that was on the floor of her residence. They literally, using a, a toothpick and a tweezers, go and pull off every single hair from the tape lifts and go through the vacuum cleaner. She had a cat, so there was a lot of cat hair on those tape lifts, and I can't imagine being the examiner at the lab and determine was this a cat hair? Was this a human hair? Is this just a fiber? And then having to microscopically look at them and compare them to Josh Wade's hair to see if there's any, any connection. After going through all of that, they were able to find a hair that had Josh Wade's DNA profile. We now can place Josh Wade in Mindy's house. The investigators are thrilled, and on May 18, 2008, 10 months after Mindy's disappearance, Wade is charged with her murder. But do police have a strong enough case to seek the death penalty? The fact that Wade is already in jail helps. Because he's not trying to convince people not to talk. He's not putting pressure on other people who may be a witness not to say anything to the police. Or so they think until they discover that Josh Wade had reconnected with former girlfriend Lisa, the woman who'd identified him from the ATM photo and could testify to that in court. After he was arrested, she started visiting him at the jail. And Joshua then goes and convinces her to marry him. Which was against jail policy. He was told that he could not do it, but he did. It was so that she would not testify against him because now she was his wife. Their jailhouse marriage is declared invalid, but not before investigators have begun to wonder what Lisa knows about Josh that he's so determined to keep secret. We went to her um, place of employment, and we sat down and talked to her. She said, yes, she married Joshua Wade, but she says, that's past. I don't want to have anything to do with him. I'm not going to say anything. We tried to plead to her sense of responsibility. We talked to her about she was a mom, and what would she do if this was one of her children? And Lisa still told me to, that she didn't want to talk. The following day, however... I got a phone call from our dispatch center, and they said that there's a lady named Lisa that wanted to talk to me. She says, I was thinking about what you said. 
And I want to tell you, she says, I have everything. He confessed to me. The investigators sit Lisa down for an interview. She told us that she and Josh had had a conversation in the jail and that Josh had told her that there was a party that was going on at the house that evening. She says that Josh, who was flat broke, decided to burglarize the home next door. He broke in. He said as he was rummaging through her things, Mindy came out of the back bedroom and surprised him. He says, I'm not going back to jail. I have a witness here that can't be a witness. Wade makes Mindy lie down on the bathroom floor, and he ties her up. Then he went home and got his gun, zip ties, the things that he would need to abduct her. He doesn't want to leave any evidence. He gets some garbage bags. He puts the garbage bags on his feet, and he tapes his feet. And then came back to Mindy still laying on the floor in the bathroom, put her into the car, laid her down in the back seat, and put a blanket over her. Then drove more than an hour outside of town and forced her to walk into the woods. He told Mindy that he was going to let her go, had her kneel down, because he told her that he was going to cut the restraints off of her. And then he kills her by pointing the gun and pulling the trigger in the back of her head. I just thought, what the hell she had to go through? Just a horrible night. And just such an evil guy, how he could do that to anybody. He made the bed, he vacuumed, he did everything consistent with somebody trying to hide that he was the person responsible for her death. And in the fall of 2009, two years after Mindy's murder, the hearing for Josh Wade gets underway in an Anchorage courtroom. Neither Bob Conway nor the mother of Della Brown miss a day. I got strength from her, and she probably got some strength from me. In the hopes of bringing closure to the friends and family of both victims, we told Wade that if he confessed to killing Mindy Schloss, and he also accepted responsibility for the death of Della Brown, that we would take the death penalty off the table. To the relief of Della Brown's mother, Wade agrees to the plea deal. Well, the important thing was that she finally got him to admit that, you know, that he did kill her daughter. And it was just, it was a huge relief to her. I could see that. It was big for both of us. Accordingly, I sentence Mr. Wade to a term of 99 uh, years without the possibility of ever being released uh, for the remainder of his natural life. It was a relief to know that, you know, hopefully it's bringing some peace to Mindy, knowing that that guy's off the street, and that, you know, hopefully the world's a little safer. There's definite sense of satisfaction that we were able to get Joshua Wade away, and that satisfaction goes both to Della Brown and to Mindy Sloss. I felt that it was justice for both of them to make sure that he never, ever be outside of jail again. Mm -hmm.